Michael Wilcock and I are doing a, a tag team here. Um, he will start, I'll provide the, some of the meat in the, in the middle and then he'll come back at the end. Um, Michael, Very good. Uh, you might introduce yourself a bit. No, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Kirk indicated, my name is Michael Wilcock. I work in the research department of the World Bank and have for just over 18 years now. <laughs> Uh, tr among other things, trying to f uh, incorporate social dimensions more broadly into how we think about uh, the ways in which societies change, the way in which services get delivered. Uh, about a year or so ago, uh, Kirk approached me with this challenge of uh, can we figure out a way of incorporating the social dimensions into these broader questions of wealth? And my first response to that was, well, if we're going to do this, we have to have uh, the wonderful John Halliwell, a Canadian economist, joined us in this quest because he's probably one of the leading people that has worked simultaneously in the space of both social capital and subjective well-being. And it, um, between the three of us, it, it seemed that uh, some way of being able to integrate these different domains of inquiry might help us to take a first stab at being able to fill in the blank category essentially at number six on the OECD's uh, list of sources of wealth on institutional and social capital. So I present this in the spirit of, uh, we present this in the spirit of sort of a first approximation at an attempt to try and say something minimally sensible about that particular space. What would it look like? Uh, we suggest, some believe that whatever generationally down the track, <laughs> uh, something like a fuller accounting of the wealth of nations, if, if that happens in a way that incorporates the social dimension, we suspect it'll maybe look a little something like this. Um, but we are presenting it today and in the book, I guess, as a, as a first offering of a, of a way of trying to make sense of some of this. I'm going to use my space just to give sort of the intuition around this idea of, of social capital and uh, recognize, I, th that I, th I hope, that we're working in a space that has, uh, at least for the best part of the last 15 years, been something that the OECD itself has recognized. Uh, this incorporation of it into the lists of the wealth of nations is not something that's just been done relatively recently. Um, over the best part of 16 years, I've been in a series of uh, conferences in Paris where people have been trying to uh, do versions of this, and conceptually, Everyone's more or less on board. There's been a whole series of debates, as you would expect, in the academic literature about how to define, how to analyze, and how to, in some sense, measure this. But we just simply haven't had the array of data that we now have that would enable us to make a first stab at how this might contribute to something like uh, the wealth accounting. So we're going to try and do something like that. I want to use my remaining time, though, just to uh, cite an oft referred to passage from David Hume's uh, treatise on human nature, uh, which bears repeating, uh, largely because I think in an initial discussion here about we're looking at what kind of wealth social capital and, and trust might represent, I think it's uh, appropriate that uh, we recognize that we're hardly the first people to worry about this. There's something like this has been a concern for a long period of time. In volume one of a treatise of human nature, Hume writes, your corn is ripe today, mine will be so tomorrow. It is profitable for us both that I should labor with you today and that you should aid me tomorrow. But I have no kindness for you and know you have as little for me. I will not, therefore, take any pains upon your account and should I labor with you upon my own account in expectation of a return, I know I should be disappointed and that I should in vain depend upon your gratitude. Here then, I leave you to labor alone. You treat me in the same manner. The seasons change, and both of us lose our harvests for want of mutual confidence and security. All right. So if one is thinking about different sources of wealth here, why are Hume's farmers much less wealthy than they might otherwise be? Is it because their land is inadequately fertile? No. Is it because property rights are not being upheld? No. Is it because they're clueless farmers that actually don't have, know what to do with corn? No. Is it because they don't have the right tools for being able to plow their fields and being able to reap the harvest? Inadequate produce capital? No. Uh, which is not to say that any of those other things don't matter. Crucially, of course, they do. 
Maybe they're just out of luck. Maybe the problem is that uh, there was a plague, there was pestilence, there was a fire, there was a flood. None of those things seems to have happened here either. The problem with their much less wealth problem <laughs> is that they can't work together. The problem they are fundamentally engaged in requires human cooperation. There is a finite window in which to undertake the task before them that requires more than just one person or one family. It requires a team. And unless that team can figure out how to do its thing, the wealth is squandered, or at least a very sizable portion of it just goes to waste. And I think broadly that parable, as it were, is a nice summation of a lot of the problems that we, that we face. That the, the problems are not too much to do with the, in, the lack of importance of the other sources of wealth, it's to do with the combining of the wealth, as Eric reminded us last night. And that in an age of globalization, as our, as our financial systems, as our trade routes, as our migration patterns, everything gets increasingly larger in scale, so accordingly does our requirement to trust those systems to do what they are supposed to do and to trust each other. And so I suggest that two days before a vote on Brexit and 140 days before a potential Trump presidency, <laughs> that we live in a world where there's a great degree of distrust of strangers, of foreigners coming in, a great distrust of leaders of one kind or another, a great distrust even in expertise, the kind that should make a Brexit type discussion relatively straightforward as a strict empirical matter. But by all accounts here in the last week or so, there's been an overt concession that this now comes down to something called emotion because it is an emotional decision, because it is fundamentally in some sense driven by a deep sense of uh, antagonism, a deep sense of distrust about people, those who don't look like us, who don't speak like us, and who are potentially or perceived to be uh, threatening either everything from national identity to uh, occupations. So these questions of trust really matter. And the fact, and they've mattered for a long time, and they will continue to matter for a long time, but the fact that we struggle to measure them, the fact that we struggle to model them, doesn't mean inherently that they don't matter. It just means that we need to try harder. And so uh, our paper makes an attempt to do both of those things. It makes an attempt not just to uh, a a lay out an analytic framework, which makes an attempt to try and model it, and tries an att attempt at measuring it. And as Kurt will show you in the subsequent slides, really, I think, uh, makes a, a, a somewhat brave, but I think quite su a substantial finding regarding just how important uh, the social capital space is in the broader accounting of the wealth of nations. Let me just conclude with a broad anecdote just to show just how salient this stuff is. When I was in uh, Japan just a few months ago, it was, I heard this anecdotally, but until I actually saw it, and, and it made had a very quite emotional impact on me, was a mother just saying goodbye to her two sons, aged about six and eight, and put them on a train, bound to go on a little fishing trip. And I thought, oh, maybe they'll just go one or two stations, and careful instructions about when to get off. These kids sat on the train with us for an hour and 20 minutes, going from one completely different part of the country to another. And I saw a tear in my eye. I was looking at these kids after a while going, wow, what an amazing country that you can put six and seven year old boys on a train and completely trust that there aren't going to be crazy people out there, distrustful people out there, that if these kids get lost, that you will have complete confidence that adults will be around them and we'll shepherd them and put them in the right way. What an amazing society <laughs> would actually be structured like that. Um, and I think what these social capital questions for us are things that uh, only become palpable when we face existential questions like Brexit, but they're around us all the time. And to, I think as the rest of this conference is showing, these kinds of new sources of wealth um, have long been recognized, but we're in a much stronger position now, I think, to move a little bit further towards trying to do some serious social science with this in the space of, of modeling and measuring. And Kirk is gonna take us through our first attempt to try to do that. Thank you. So uh, like any good paper, we have a model. Um, uh, and since it has Hamilton's name on it, it, it is a, a growth model. Um, we're starting from three very large surveys on subjective well-being, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, Gallup World Poll, the World Value Survey, and, and one whose name I forget at the moment. Um, 
we, there's, uh, on, if you think of this as, as uh, a regression on the left-hand side, you have uh, the value of uh, um, happiness or well-being that, that the respondent uh, re reports. On the right-hand side, you have a whole list of possible contributors to, uh, to well-being. Um, and there are, in particular, questions about um, this, this, this issue of trust and a sort of standard question about, by and large, can you trust people to do the right thing, or do you always have to check up on, on people's actions? Um, so uh, we actually do that uh, regression analysis to say, um, what is the cont contribution of uh, income to well-being? This is an income question. And then uh, a set of related questions on uh, how much does this notion of trust uh, add to your well-being. Uh, and then we can, in effect, take the ratio of the marginal utilities. Right? Um, this is familiar territory to say what is the unit value in dollar terms of, of trust from, uh, from this exercise. Um, we have a simple growth model that uh, says that uh, social trust is, uh, has a is a public good, in, in effect. Um, it can provide benefits both to production and to direct well-being, uh, which is what the surveys are giving us. Uh, so this, this paper is not looking into the question of does trust make us more productive. There is a very small literature on that, and it's something we might consider pursuing farther in this domain. Um, and there's an argument in the, in the presentation of the model that, um, that uh, we have a fairly good isolated measure of the impact of uh, trust on, uh, on well-being and on, on a flow of well-being in monetary terms using this price that we can derive. Um, now, we're careful, uh, we're careful at every stage we, uh, in terms of how we use the data, in terms of how strong a case we feel we can make with the data, uh, trying to choose conservative values all the way through. Um, because uh, when it comes to describing this, um, because um, social trust uh, doesn't have exchange value in the sense that other types of assets we're familiar with, you can, you can buy or you can rent in the case of human capital. Uh, this is not that type of asset. So what we're, we're doing is constructing an asset value of this flow of well-being, uh, but we're not claiming it has the same status in some sense as other types of capital that they were more familiar with. The exercise is really to say, to give us an empirical sense of how large is this if we think of it as an asset. Uh, and it has asset properties, right? The, the, these social constructs lead to a stream of benefits. Um, and then to be able to compare that to other um, numbers that we have. So let me just quickly run through uh, this. We have uh, sort of low trust, uh, high trust uh, examples here. Uh, with a, some attempt to balance across regions. We've managed to miss South Asia in the tables I've done here. Um, and so we see this uh, uh, very, quite a large uh, amount of variation across, as, as you would expect, right, um, across countries. Um, so we have a price times a score on um, trust gives us um, and then capitalize that gives us an asset value, which we then divide by uh, the value of total wealth coming from the World Bank uh, database on, uh, on wealth. Uh, and so you, you have these two things interacting. And in some cases, I don't have China here because it has very high score on trust. It's up nearly as high as, as the usual suspects, right, the Scandinavians. Um, but we have a particularly problematic measure of the total wealth of China, and so you get a very unreasonably high, high number. Uh, but these are things we can fix. Um, so we do get uh, considerable variation. Uh, in terms of comparing wealth uh, as uh, social capital, social trust, to other types of wealth, so here for selected countries, 
um, where we have uh, human capital estimates. So the green is, is the human capital. Um, that is by far the largest source of wealth that we find in anywhere we do this work. Um, but the headline, to my mind, is that this value of social trust um, is comparable to the value of uh, produced asset, the loss of growth across the countries that we're looking at. Uh, so if we think of the SNA balance sheet, this is pretty much as large as, as what is the standard thing that's reported in the SNA balance sheet. It's considerable, um, but again, we're not going to oversell this as we have a new measure of the wealth of nations where we're adding social trust on top of everything else. It's not that type of, uh, of wealth. So with that, we'll come to conclusion. Then back to Michael. So we, how long have I got? Not long. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's done by people that are affiliated with the bank, so we figured we have to have something called policy implications that flowed out of all of this. Um, and I think there are some things that one might think are just relatively straightforward in the sense that they follow either logically or are consistent with what one might be doing more broadly as part of a, a social include, inclusion agenda. Um, but I think the bigger part of this is that to see it, as Kirk indicated, as, as something that's a complement to a lot of other things that need to be going on simultaneously. So to the extent that social trust really is about uh, having a collective sense of, of belonging to a particular community or in this, uh, right now into, in terms of a, a particular nation, then things that overtly help that particular process, whether it be in the redu reduction of inequality and reduction of social exclusion, seem to us to be at least consistent with uh, the enhancing the likelihood that people res will respond to this uh, question that's been long asked in the general social survey and longer around whether most people can be trusted or not. But I think a more specific thing rather than just general or generic uh, policies of inclusion uh, is to do with practices as much as anything else. At least in our work in developing countries, a large part of people's experience of what uh, Stuart Corbridge calls the everyday state, the state that people encounter most frequently, teachers, policemen, uh, health officials, the everyday state is often, in many people's lives, is such a predatory experience. It's not one of, of functionality. It's not one that if I dial the equivalent of, a, of 911 that I expect a police officer will show up and treat me with dignity, take my concerns seriously. Oftentimes, uh, the police are part of the problem, not part of the solution. So whatever the policies might be in this particular space, I think a large part of what we need to be focusing on, at least in the developing country sense, is is the practices about how people secure access to services and in particular how over time they come to regard the legitimacy of the state as something that is doing its job. A large part of the most complicated work of the state is to do things that people don't like, uh, to deal with the fact that large numbers of citizens uh, will lose elections. A very sizable proportion of a, of a citizenry will lose election. Upwards of, even if Brexit doesn't happen, probably something like 47% of the population is still going to think they should have. So how do they regard the legitimacy of the process by which these very existential questions are made? And in many countries, I think the, the low trust is a function of the fact that there is no legitimacy accorded to the systems not just that are supposed to be doing the things that we all want to, to work well, like functioning schools and hospitals and roads, but the more vexing questions of how we engage with questions of the state doing things that a large suburb of people would rather it not do, uh, like raise our taxes, like regulate our, our behaviour. Uh, and if we live in a world in which states are not perceived to be doing things that are legitimate, or when then we're doing things that are that are generating outcomes that we perceive to be unfavorable to ourselves, I think all of those then in reinforce these cycles by which uh, deep forms of distrust become uh, reinforced and uh, perpetuate over time. And I'll conclude by saying this is not just a, rich, a poor country issue. I think the very nature of uh, Western democracies and the kinds of challenges that we are living through as we speak are functions of quite serious crises of the legitimacies of states to do complex things. And, uh, 
it's a broader problem for which these kinds of analyses are just conversation starters and the beginning is my hope of, of trying to put some empirical frames around uh, questions for which there inherently won't be neat answers. Thanks very much. Uh, morning. Uh, I'm Alex. I'm an economic theorist. I work with Cameron. Um, and it's a great pleasure to discuss a paper like this. Uh, some of my sort of early graduate work was on um, network formation, social network formation and social groups. So this is actually up my street, very strangely. Uh, and the, the first version of the paper I got, um, somehow the, the printer failed and none of the equations uh, showed up. Uh, so I had the pleasure of reading this paper without any of the equations being in it at all. And so to a theorist, it was a great fetish to reimagine exactly what the Hamiltonian looked like and, you know, all the derivatives. So I had a lot of pleasure. And actually, once I printed out the paper and had the equations, most of it was right. So um, at least, you know, I can say that the theory is solid. I checked it without, you know, by redoing it myself. Um, um, but let me just sort of make um, three points about this paper. I think it's immensely brave. I think this is the bravest paper that's been presented uh, in this conference. I think this is probably the coolest research agenda that might come out of this book because this is something that I think a lot of people have been too scared to touch. And I, and I think it's a, it's a really kind of great first step towards doing this. And we all know that trust matters. And the authors in the two papers that they have make a kind of very strong case that trust matters for a lot of things, discrimination, health, unemployment, and Colin just made a point about how it makes a, a great deal of difference in financial transactions. But let me sort of pick at a few things, kind of be an annoying theorist and, and poke, sort of try and poke some holes. So I guess the first one is really exactly what it is that we're measuring with that sort of wonderful broad question that we've had for 50 years. You know, generally speaking, do you trust others? Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's not particularly clear to me whether that question really is capturing trust, is it capturing social capital, is it sort of proxying for some kind of institutions that are going on. And this criticism gets made over and over again, it's sort of nothing uh, particularly original. Uh, and yet, if we are going to say that this is a component of, of overall wealth and so this becomes social capital, then we're actually making a very strong claim that this is social capital, this is suddenly not a proxy for good institutions or for something else, right? So we're making a particular claim. We're now assigning a, a label to it, which is social capital. Um, so then, what, and, and sort of what, once that's in your mind, you might think, okay, so what does this model actually look like? Uh, and actually, sort of theoretically, the model is very similar to how you might write a model, uh, an environmental economic model, where you have a, a dirty good and the, it, it produces sort of um, some, some, some pollution, and both your utility and the production get affected by the pollution. Now, substitute pollution for social capital, the model is actually identical. So this, these models go back to sort of mid-80s, so Krauthammer kind of had this kind of model, and that's exactly the setup that you get. And what you get is, is sort of an identity in this, where your income equals to the consumption plus the change in capital plus that extra term, which is the social capital. So previously, when we had models like this, it used to be something like you know, your dirty good or, you know, your natural resource, whatever it might be, that produces pollution. Here now, it suddenly becomes social capital. And sort of, I'm just not convinced that income really does, is consumption plus, um, you know, your, your use of, of social capital plus that change in physical capital. It seems like there is, you know, it inter, you know social capital interacts with consumption in much more profound ways in order to in, in order to sort of to generate income. Um, it is not easily separable and substitutable in the same way as um, natural resources might be in production. And so all the other usual criticism of these models applied, like constant returns to scale and so on. So I think generally looking at this as a kind of just another public good, rather than something that has evolved over time and gone through institutions and gone through kind of complex evolutionary processes that have created a particular culture in a country seems a little too simple. So maybe that's an easy poke. So may maybe that's, that's, sort of, that, that's not fair. Maybe this is the right kind of first obvious model to write. So then the next step is you've got this model. It gives you very nice tight predictions, give you an idea of how you estimate this. And um, uh, Kirk talked about this um, way, that, you know, they look at the marginal um, uh, uh, the, the sort of the ratio of the, the marginal effect of social capital on utility or on well-being 
and they divide it by the marginal, uh, 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 by the marginal utility of consumption, which is what they call compensated differential, something I've not seen before, but it's a kind of a nice term. Now, these are two numbers you need to estimate from, um, from empirics. They have to come from somewhere. They come from the regression. But in the end, uh, the authors kind of use this one particular number. It ends up being a half, which is that ratio which they estimate. Now, I, I kind of have a lot of uh, issues with it. Um, it seems like the error bounds on this estimate must be pretty high. Um, for example, so this kind of comes outside of the model. You, separate, you, you estimate these, these, these two values separately, then you plug them into your model. First of all, you might think this is not a number that is going to be uh, global, universal, and not time varying. E even if you could estimate a number like this, it would be country specific and it would vary across time. And this is not something that is done. Also, I I'm just not sure these numbers are estimated particularly well. They also make a very good point, actually. They, they do discuss how it varies depending on whether you look at sort of the individual level trust versus the country level trust. But, for example, the, the, the marginal utility of, uh, of, 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 of consumption. Um, you get a sort of a number of 0.5, and the literature I've seen is sort of double that, roughly. Um, and and you, know, may, you know, maybe this is a pure empirical question. I shouldn't wade into it as a theorist. Um, but you know, this is, uh, this is uh, something that is sort of half the size versus what I've seen. You, you was sort of, uh, versus what I've seen kind of makes me a little suspicious. And so the final point, sort of once you're worried about the theory to some extent, you're worried about the empirics to some extent, then the last slide, as John presented, was on policy. And this is where I worry the most. So, uh, you know, on a shaky model with, you know, the best data that you can possibly get, you, there are kind of very strong policy implications, and I'm just, and I'm really not convinced by these at all. So, there is a lot that is captured by this one question. And we are hoping that it is something to do with social capital, but there could be a lot of things going on. So we know things like religion and identity and social networks really matter to people's outcome. Now, how do we know necessarily that a particular policy would be only increasing that particular component that is called social capital? It could be affecting other dimensions, like it could be changing the way in which social groups interact with one another. This could be you know, various religious groups. This could be, you know, group, you know, identities that involve endogenously. You know, Uber drivers probably feel like a very cool club together. And so, a lot of these sort of policies, if applied in a in a in a in a way that is a little blunt, which is what this question is—a very blunt, broad question, which is in some way it's 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 uh, what's so great about it, could have a lot of unintended consequences. We actually, break what we might think of trust as down through different channels that are not. <laughs> captured here at all. Um, good. Well, that, that's probably a cue for me to get off. Now, I'll just, give you, I'll, just give you, I'll just give you one example. I'll just give you one example of this that comes from social network research, which is something that is not obvious, um, sort of ex ante, until you really go out and measure this. And some part of social capital might be, you know, the quality and, of our friendships and how many friends we have and, and, and uh, what kind of friends they are. And you might say, well, it's very good that, for example, children have friends that uh, are not sort of uh, too segregated, let's say, in race. Uh, and let's say, you know, this might be a good thing. So uh, you, you, would, you, you, you could see how the composition of particular schools affects the segregation in children's friendships. And what you find amazingly is that the schools in which friendships are most segregated, where children of the same race tend to proportionally have kids who are their friends of the same race, are schools in which there is a balance of races. So in very segregated schools, if you like, of school of the same race, actually there is a lot of mixing in terms of friendships. Now that is a very non-obvious thing until you go out to measure this. But there's profound impacts for both kids' outcomes, it has impacts on social capital, and there's impacts on their well-being. But trying to tinker with something as complex as this to me, could have these very strange impacts where you might actually end up harming. So you might say, okay, well, let's desegregate the schools and mix them together. But indeed, the unintended consequence would be that children end up drawing their friendships into their own race, and the overall welfare um, outcome might be worse. So I love this agenda, and I hope you know hundreds of papers get written on it, and they all cite yours, because it's an amazing first step. Um, but I, I, I think we have to be very cautious and perhaps play down some of these um, um, conclusions 
a little bit. And I leave you with this great quote. So as much as I like trust, sometimes I think you can have perfectly good relationships without trust. And there is a great quote, actually, uh, by the promiscuous count in All's World That Ends Well. And he said, love all, trust a few, do wrong to none. So there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, for some excellent comments there. Um, it's coffee time, but let's just take, I know, uh, let's, <laughs> let, let's take, uh, goodness, I've seen f six, seven hands already. Okay, we'll take seven questions. There have to be questions, they have to be short. Let's start there with Rolando and move over. Um, I've not read the paper, so I don't know whether this is covered, but it seems to me that they would, you probably would expect some interaction between social capital and quality of institutions. And uh, that might be an interesting avenue to, to look at, that good institutions uh, may promote social trust. Willem? Uh, uh, does the paper actually look at what the drivers of social trust are? On one of the slides, it seemed to it refer to uh, you know, inequality and social inclusion as being important for social trust. Is that simply an assertion, or is that actually tested in the papers? More, more generally, um, uh, uh, what do you think of views like the one associated with Paul Collier, that the um, uh, homogeneity, if you want, ethnic, cultural, religious, and others, is important for social trust? Your Japan anecdote uh, seems to fit that, uh, unfortunately, yeah. Ed, in front. Yes, along that line, uh, I think maybe you have it in the paper, but it'd be interesting to show actual levels of social trust per capita or something of that nature. I don't know whether you... And then it'd be interesting, since you use the Japan anecdote, to see whether Japan is high, uh, ranks high among these countries. Uh, yeah, it was also interesting that Saudi Arabia was so high. Oh, and uh, so it'd be interesting to... Well, of course, you could do a lot of different kinds of cross-country analyses, but uh, uh, certainly per capita levels would be very useful, I would say. Right. Michael? Maybe, <laughs> maybe somewhat potentially related to the Saudi Arabia question. In, a, in one of the recent world value surveys, uh, when the question was asked, how satisfied are you, Libyans did extremely well. So, which raises the question of a, a nice little civil war will help satisfaction. <laughs> so, what, what, do the, what do the data mean? Okay, Truda, behind. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just thinking about, you mentioned schools and hospitals and police as examples. And actually, banking system is, is um, somewhere we often also can measure trust. And in Norway, we've had this case of mis-selling of financial products, and it has been a measurable decline in trust in bankers and banking as, as a sector. And that is actually quite interesting, because one of the really explicit legislative objectives of financial market regulation is to elicit trust and confidence in, in the market. And um, from a legal perspective, actually, you could also ask what kind of legislation is most apt to create a an environment of trust. Is it structural reg regulation or is it more behavioral regulation? And where will you have the largest enforcement problems? Okay, Thank great. you. Um, go to John. Uh, how well has let you down? That, um, <laughs> Canada got very excited about, about this trust issue five or eight years ago. They conducted a large survey in Cape Breton, which is full of low income people to see if they helped each other getting jobs. And there's been excellent high quality research published on this by a guy named Steve Lehrer, L-E-H-E-R, and uh, with completely different methodological approach to yours, which is not to deny that yours would be as highly innovative, but there is this completely separate strand of trust work that's gone on of very high quality. Okay, great, Brian? In a similar vein, I mean, this, the, the drivers of social trust have been extensively studied, um, both by economists and sociologists. There's a large sociological literature. Javier, in fact, has, here has uh, 
contributed in terms of the relationship between, for example, inequality and social trust. But, but in terms of what the paper is trying to do, I was slightly confused because Michael's um, tale of the two farmers was pointing us directly towards the role of social trust in increasing our capacity to make use of our other assets to be more productive in the future and to increase consumption. Whereas that was what Kirk said was not going to be the focus. And instead the focus was on uh, the direct implications of living in a high trust versus a low trust society for our subjective well-being. In which case it wasn't obvious to me, apart from all the issues that were, that were mentioned about how we would capture that, uh, where I think at, at a minimum one would need uh, uh, longitudinal over, uh, data over time. It wasn't clear to me why we would be looking at social trust rather than all the many other things that, that we think impact on subjective well-being, uh, if that has now become our metric. But I thought the common metric here was consumption, uh, in which case the focus would seem to be more sensibly on the, the bit that Kirk said is, is much less studied, uh, but, but, but is, is that not the one that's directly relevant here? Okay, seven uh, good comments, critiques, questions. Um, do you want to quickly respond? Yeah, my, the, the passage from Hume actually isn't in the paper. I use that largely for pedagogical purposes just because I like it. <laughs> and I think it really helps to, in a, in a discussion over the last few days, which has been looking at different forms and sources of wealth, I just thought it was pedagogically interesting to look at these different uh, reasons why wealth creation can come unglued. And one of those, I think, in that particular parable but is, but pertains to the absence of trust. But uh, it's not, as, as Kirk indicated, it's not actually how the paper per se is structured, which is uh, rather differently. Um, just before I say anything else, just the, the fact that so many of you want to talk about this kind of stuff, I think a large, large part of this paper does its work precisely through that. <laughs> right? It's not because there is uh, an E equals MC squared out there waiting to be discerned and somewhere, somehow, someone's going to figure out what that looks like. It's through this kind of deliberation that this kind of work advances. And I think it's true in, in society more broadly. So uh, having been inside this sausage factory for the best part of my career, I've <laughs> heard variations on these kinds of critiques uh, several, many times, and they're real and they're serious. Uh, but if there was a, a simple way of answering all, then we surely would have figured out what to do about that. The, the, the you know, paper I did a few years ago for the Annual Review of Political Science, I, argued this whole thing about social capital was an essentially contested concept. It's a philosophical idea from the 1950s, but it basically says it doesn't matter how many conferences, how many papers get written on this stuff, there is no eureka moment awaiting for this kind of stuff. It's because it's so deeply part of the human experience and so what it means to be human, we're just not going to figure this out in some clean way, but we can make incremental progress of sorts. And it happens through these kinds of discussions. It happens when people are crazy enough to put their names on papers that they know full well are going to be deeply imperfect in terms of what they're getting at. But they're a first step. Someone's going to do it. <laughs> uh, and people that are smarter than us and uh, will come along later on and build on that and refine it a little bit. And that's how scholarship happens. So uh, this is a first sort of humble step in that direction. I, I, I like to think, though, that just in the t defense of the final part of the paper on, on policy, we're not, we're not trying to be uh, engin social engineers. There's, not, there's a large part of what we're really just trying to say is that what do we, what do we, what's either consistent with the kind of story we're telling here, or what do we know from other literature, or just from uh, the prevailing moment that we live in about w where these forms and sources of just distrust really happen. And, and perhaps just because of my own experience, primarily based in uh, working in developing countries, where the state is so frequently a source of, uh, of predation on people's lives, the beginnings of anything that starts to be either at an individual level or through an institutionalized mechanism, a basis on which people start to work credibly and coherently with each other at larger scales of aggregation to produce what we then would recognize as a modern economy and society. Uh, is a step in that, in that kind of direction. But I, I'm under no illusion that there is a, a lever and a dial out there with social capital on it that we could twist one way or another. And that's just a, that's a, a Wellian kind of dream. We don't, we don't want to be part of any of that. But there are nonetheless, policy happens in ways that can be uh, 
either implicitly, explicitly, overtly, or covertly related to or have consequences for these things, and at least having some filters on that or some basis for which we think about the ways in which those things impact upon societies and other things that we care about normatively because we care about a lot of stuff normatively. To me, that's, that's okay. There's, there's, uh, we don't have to just be mapping our policy explicitly off what the evidence says, as we've discussed around public infrastructure, if that was the only basis on which key decisions had been made ever, then we would be, <laughs> we'd be in Jakarta rather than in London. And I think that's uh, true of a lot of this stuff in the social space as well. Right, Greg, did you have anything to add? Just, just, take, just a, a couple of things. Um, one is, the, what the question I had at the outset in this paper is, um, when it comes to the policy end of things, what do we actually know about investing in social capital? How do we, right, how do we create it? Uh, and Mike was right that there is a literature out there, a sociological literature, uh, of social science, uh, that, that talks about things that, that seem to be at least correlated with building trust. And, uh, and there was a question about what, you know, why, why trust it specifically? Why do we use that when the, when the topic is social capital? We try to argue that this seems to be probably the strongest central tens, uh, tendency in the literature to say that, that, that when people talk about social capital that um, it is trust that seems to be the central part of the, uh, of the problem that, that, that the literature has settled on is what we, uh, um, we also um, did look a lot at how the, the price varies uh, across countries, across uh, data sources, uh, all of that. Um, and, and again, tried to simplify to say uh, this number, the answer is 0 0.5. Uh, as a very conservative number, looking at all those, at the, at the variation that we get from those different sources. So, um, and we say that it's, it's nothing more than that, right? Um, we've tried to be conservative in, in doing this, because you, you can very easily get very large numbers doing, doing this, right? Um, so, um, The, the question of, uh, I, and I, I did say, you know, we, the model has a, a trust as a public good that affects <coughs> production and uh, well-being directly. Um, we chose to focus on the latter question, um, so maybe the, you know, again, the quote didn't quite work. Um, but it's also clear that there is a literature, it could be developed here, there's a very small literature so far on trust and, and productivity. Uh, you know, one or two early nice papers on uh, Italy. Uh, but I think we should probably have some coffee. Great. So many new directions for research. I suggest we go and build some social capital over a cup of coffee. And we'll be back here for the keynote from Diane shortly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>